everyone, and welcome to From Tip to Tail, a podcast dedicated to animal welfare. This podcast is sponsored by Cuddly. Cuddly is the only crowdfunding platform built specifically for animal welfare organizations worldwide. I'm Bridget. And I'm Sydney. We've spent years working with animal rescues and have seen such amazing innovation, strength, and heart. Having this personal connection with rescuers has made us more informed, grateful, and inspired. We hope by giving you an inside look, you will be too. Today, we're going to be speaking with Dr. Ruth Ann Lobos, who has more than 15 years experience in the pet food industry. She was responsible for directing global scientific programs and events for Purina Institute. And currently, she's part of the team of experts at Merrick who work tirelessly to formulate and produce the highest quality and most nutritious food for dogs and cats. So let's get started. Hi, Ruth Ann. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you, Bridget? Excellent. So how's the... You're in Colorado, right? So how's the weather over there? <laughs> uh, yeah, so we just thankfully are getting a big snowstorm this weekend. We had a cold front come through because it is much needed. Uh, we've just been in such a severe drought. And as y'all are familiar with over there in, in California, having those wildfires go through, has they are we've broken the wrong kind of records this year um, with those and are still pretty some pretty big active ones burning right now. So the snow, while I am a little disappointed because I love to do out, do things outside, especially with my dogs, but 20 degrees with a low of nine is not something <laughs> we like very much, but, oh but the gosh. snow will certainly help our firefighters in a huge way. So we're, we're excited about that. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. I know. I'm just We're a little bit jealous of like weather in general at this point. We're like, oh, it's finally not 80 degrees. I know we're like um, enjoying, I guess, like this coming week, it's going to be 70. And we're like, oh, praise be, it's going to be 70 finally. (laughs) You have to get your parkas out. I know, right? (laughs) Um, So we're super excited to get into this conversation here because I know it's, it's something that I feel like is just so hard for people to, to dig down and find like, Vaccine, because everyone has a bit of an opinion as far as like nutrition and and different things here. Um, but before we do that, I was wondering if we could go a little bit into who you are, what your background is, and how you got into the the pet sector. Sure, yeah, happy to share on all fronts. <laughs> <laughs> Went to LSU, Louisiana State University, for vet school, and then I was in private practice for about two and a half years. And I kind of say, you know. Life has a funny way of kind of opening doors and telling us where we are supposed to go, even though at that time we may or may not know that that's our true path. You know, I had a, I got a phone call from a friend of mine who said, hey, we have a pet food company that's looking to hire some veterinarians. Do you know anybody? At the time, the position was up in the Midwest and I have family up there and they said, do you have, do you know of anybody who um, would be interested? And and I said, you know, I'd had just a, a really bad day at work. And my dad, who has been a businessman his whole life and owned several businesses and, and been a kind of a mentor of mine, had always the phrase of like, don't ever say no to an opportunity to explore. And so I was like, I don't know. I was like, I might actually be interested. I don't even know what the position is, but I'm frustrated today. And, you know, so I I went ahead and I interviewed and it just, it just blew me away. And the pet food sector. And I, I thought that it would be something that I would only do for about three or four years. And it has turned out to be an incredibly fascinating um, journey of twists and turns and no day is the same. And um, I just really enjoyed being able to to your point earlier about kind of helping to demystify nutrition. And there are so many self-proclaimed experts. Everybody has an opinion and they come in bringing their own personal uh, nutritional philosophies when they enter in. And, and so helping to kind of navigate those waters and the aisles of the pet food stores um, has been a really interesting journey and, an, and also an honor because I, having three dogs uh, of my own, I know how important they are to our family. I've got a human child as well, one one little guy who's five, and just watching the bonds between them and the bonds that we have um, with our four-legged 
giving them that opportunity to thrive and live the longest, healthiest, happiest life, highest quality life that they can is truly an honor. That's amazing. I think, so Sydney worked a bit in the vet industry and I'm sure she can absolutely empathize with any frustration you were feeling at that time. It seems like it it can be, I mean, so rewarding, but also like there are definitely these like really hard moments, I think, in that area. Yeah, for sure. And and I've also, I've been fortunate enough too that the companies that I've worked for have seen the value in having me continue to practice. And I think that's part of also the reason why I stay so job satisfied. It's kind of, um, I have a very small rehab practice. So I'm certified in canine rehabilitation, which is the way we can say kind of dog physical therapy. And so I still, I have a small mobile practice with that. And then I also do what's called relief work. So I go and it's almost like being a substitute veterinarian at clinics in and around the Denver metro area here. And what I kind of equate it to is like being an aunt. You can borrow your niece and nephew and they're really, really cute until they start to have meltdowns. And then you want to give them back to your siblings. And you're like, okay, I'm done. Like, let's go do the fun things. And, and I'm, and I'm out. So that part, you know, again, keeps me in touch, lets me have those really one-on-one conversations with pet parents in the exam room, keep my skills as a veterinarian up to snuff and stay current, as well as then also bring some insight back to my real job as lead veterinarian for Merit. Yeah. I mean, I love that too, like with rehabilitation, because you can only imagine like nutrition and re- rehabilitation go like hand in hand in such a like a beautiful, like synergistic way. That's incredible. And and I love that. I feel like as an aunt, I like totally understand that. <laughs> <laughs> and like a, the foster, like a kitten foster, it's like the perfect mix of like, okay, I've taken good care of you for this moment. Now move on. Yeah, (laughs) now go. (laughs) Exactly. So I know for us, I mean, it seems like pet food fads are as common as food, like human food fads. Mm -hmm. It's such a bizarre thing. And every day there seems to be like something brand new and they come out of the woodwork and they're like, you haven't been doing this for the past 10 years, then you've been making a horrible mistake (laughs) and you've been doing a disservice for your pet. So I'm wondering if there were, maybe you could get into like a couple of the the food fads that you feel like are super prevalent right now. And if they're helpful, harmful, good in moderation. Sure. Yeah. And I think that, you know, there to to our point earlier is, is there is a lot misinformation. And I just heard a statistic recently that there are about five in the United States alone, there are about 5,000 different pet food brands and 227 different manufacturers that are out there. So there are a lot and it is a very, you know, it's a profitable business to be in. As we said earlier, you know, that that bond between um, our human, the humans and our pets is just immeasurable and getting stronger and stronger by the day. And I didn't graduate that long ago, but I can guarantee you the phrase pet parent did not cross my my lips when I graduated vet school, nor did it any of my professors or clinicians who were teaching me about communication. Now they they absolutely, I call them my four-legged children. They have quickly moved from the backyard to the house to the bed. And um, so, and now even more and more, we're, we're able to bring them. Restaurants are pet friendly. All of these different businesses pride themselves on being pet friendly. So it's a hugely, hugely growing sector in, you know, in the overall U.S. economy. And pet food plays a big part of that. And there are a lot of, like I said, a lot of businesses that come and go. And there are a lot of options for pet parents out there. And not all of them are are bad and not all of them are are good either. So, you know, when I'm talking to pet parents in the exam room, there's oftentimes they'll bring up a brand of food and they're saying, you know, in the history we gather, they're feeding XYZ brand. And I, even being in the industry, I've never heard of it. Well, that just because I've never heard of it doesn't necessarily mean that it's not a, you know, it's not a quality pet food that is safe and complete and balanced and all of that. So what I really talk to my pet parents about is the most important thing 
on that bag of pet food is actually the manufacturer's information, which people don't think about. You know, a lot of people are very focused on ingredients. You know, if you're in the in the veterinary industry, you're very interested in um, that guaranteed analysis. So how much protein, fat, carbohydrate, fiber, all of that, maybe the calorie content. But it's really, really important who makes the food and who is behind the company that makes the food. It is a requirement for the manufacturer to actually have a physical address and name on the bag of food, but it's not a requirement to have a telephone number, which seems a little bit odd, but, um, but that is the case. So I always, like I try to counsel my pet parents on, hey, you want to make sure that there's a phone number that's on that bag. So you, if you have any kind of question, whether it is really ingredient based, whether it's, hey, why did you put a border collie on the front of the bag? I really, you know, I'm really more partial to Australian Shepherds. You know, whatever it may be that you can call up that company and have someone on the other end of the line be able to answer your questions for you. That's where we start first and foremost is making sure that there's a, somebody that you can contact. And then there are some really great resources out there for pet parents. And one of them is the, called the Pet Nutrition Alliance, and it has a resource called Dare to Ask. And so you can go and you can look at, they actually, because again, I don't have time and a lot of pet parents don't have time and a lot of veterinarians out there don't have time to go and research every single manufacturer or every single brand that's out there. But this group of experts actually did. And they went and they have a whole line of questions that they asked about, that they asked different pet food manufacturers. And they talk about how many times they contacted and how many different ways they contacted the manufacturers to get answers to these questions. And, and so you can use that dare to ask tool to be able to look at and say, okay, who, manu- who formulates your recipes? Do you have a boarded, either boarded veterinary nutritionist, or do you have a PhD nutritionist on staff that is dedicated to formulating those recipes? Because again, we're looking at these as our dogs and cats, they are very similar to say a human infant who's being either, who's being fed formula. That formula needs to contain every micronutrient that that little baby needs. And it's the same thing for our pets with kibble. They need every single micronutrient and macronutrient in that kibble. And so you want to make sure someone who is way smarter than I am um, and has done some, you know, some really in-depth training on um, being able to formulate those recipes to be complete and balanced. Yeah. I mean, that's so amazing. And that's what a good point. I mean, the transparency that's needed there, like having a direct line to these these organizations and and the idea that at the end of the day, maybe it's not so much the name on the on the bag. Yeah. It's like the number. That's so interesting too, because I feel like even like I never thought to ask like who manufactures the food. I I was the person looking at the ingredients, looking at the reviews, looking at protein, calorie intake, things like that. So I think that, I mean, it's such a simple thought to look at who's manufacturing the food to see actually who's producing and crafting it. But I love that you said that. I feel like I'm going to go do that with my food now. I feel (laughs) weird that I haven't been. And I think the other real piece of this is, and when we're, you know, when I'm having a conversation with pet parents in in the exam room or out in the marketplace or, or wherever, really at the foundation of it is, we want to do what's best and pet parents try to make that educated decision in the best way that they know how and all different kinds of nutritional philosophies for their own self. And then sometimes they place it on what they want for their pets. And sometimes they're like, Hey, this is the way I eat, but I, you know, kind of want to go down this lane with, you know, with my dog or cat. And there are ways and there are manufacturers out there that can really address all of those nutritional philosophies in very safe ways and making sure again that it's complete and balanced for those pets at the foundation of it all but still being able to kind of lean into those nutritional preferences that the pet parent has because 
at the end of the day, they're, they're the ones who are bringing it home, right? The, mm-hmm. the dogs don't, dogs and cats don't walk in or don't, you know, get on the internet and order their own food with their <laughs> own credit card. So really, you know, kind of having that real, that heart to heart conversation with that pet parent of, okay, so what are you feeding your dog or cat now? Um, what made you go that route? Why did you pick this, these foods? What was it that stood out to you on the ingredient deck or the bag? Or did you just buy it because, hey, I'm at the store picking up this. And so I wanted to, I just needed to grab a bag of food and my dog and cat are doing fine on it. So we're just continuing. Like sometimes it's as simple as that. Sometimes a lot or a lot more often, you know, there's a lot of emotion and in-depth thought that goes into it. And so then we can have a, you know, a more productive conversation if we can understand why they're making the choices that they are. And it may or may not need a change in the formula and the brand and, and that they're feeding if their dog and cat are doing really well. So it's not always a bad thing. (laughs) Absolutely. And I mean, Mm -hmm. That's such a thoughtful answer too, um, because I feel like there are places that are like, grain-free is great, grain-free is terrible, like raw <laughs> is the way to go, raw mm-hmm. is so dangerous. But it's, I love what you're saying is like, well, it, it depends on what grain-free, what raw, like what alternative you're choosing. Like they're not all created equal and certainly they're not all going to affect one pet the same way as another. I mean especially like given age, breed, so many other factors. I mean, I just, as us as humans, it's funny to think that like what I eat wouldn't affect me the same way as what Sydney mm-hmm. eats. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, you almost need to like, you try something out, you, you do your best and then you work off of that. So I love what you're saying for sure. I do think that, and I don't know, maybe this is a reflection of the society that we live in or whatever it may be, but there's often to your point earlier is there's often times of like this shaming that if you make this decision that, oh, you are just not being a good parent to your four leggings and, oh, well, you know, if you really want to do this, then, you know, you really want to be, you know, that five-star parent, you've got to go this route. And I found that when I was pregnant with, with my son, Alexander, and like, everybody's giving you like nine kinds of advice and of the same way to do something, you know, and, uh, and you just are like, okay, well, I've got to do what works best for me on, and my family and all of that. And so kind of, again, applying that same philosophy, every dog and cat is an individual being. And so what works really, really well for one dog or cat may not work exactly the mm-hmm. same for the other one. So having those conversations and what's important to one pet parent may not be important to another. You know, we have folks who are very, very, you know, for them, organic food is, is important for them and it's important for their pet. Okay. Well, then let's sit down. Where can we find an organic pet food maker that is also from, you know, from a vet space, we take an oath to do no harm. And So where can we find an organic pet food maker that is going to be safe, complete and balanced, developed by experts so that we know I'm not, you know, putting your pet at risk by kind of quote unquote signing off on, you know, on either continuing to feed or going down and finding a new pet food that meets those needs. And so that's, again, where we can really sit down and have a good heart to heart productive conversation if I know what's important to them and they're willing to share without feeling like they're being bad parents if they, you know, choose one direction over another. Absolutely. And I mean, dipping into that too, I mean, it just feels like with our diets, with our pets diets, with everything that we're buying in like a, in society, it feels like the consumer overall is just getting so much more intelligent and like yes. making choices based off their beliefs in a lot of different ways, whether they be like, okay, well, I know the when you go down the line, their major manufacturer is, is this individual and I don't want to support them or I do want to support them. Mm-hmm. It, it gets so heated. Um, so I love that what you're saying too about your oath is to do no harm. And so you're going to point them in, in the right direction for them. <laughs> Oh, I was going to say there are other um, really great resources out there for pet parents as well. So the 
World Small Animal Veterinary Association um, is another one that has, they're not hard, fast rules by any stretch, but they at least help to kind of give pet parents some guardrails on how to make decisions about pet food. And one is called the Savvy Internet, the Savvy Internet, now I'm blanking on the name, but it's like (laughs) the cat owner, Savvy Internet Cat Owner's Guide to Nutrition and the Savvy the Internet Savvy Dog Owner's Guide to Nutrition. And so it gives at least some kind of guardrails. There's also the American College of Veterinary Nutritionists. So this is a group of board certified veterinary nutritionists. You can go to and there's all kinds of great information that's out there. There's also another one called petfoodology.org and that's run um, and it's a great resource that in consumer friendly language. So it's not overly scientific and medical focused on the veterinarian. It has some really great resources to be able to kind of break down any anything in you know in the pet nutrition space. Amazing. I mean and we'll link all this in the blog that goes along with this episode because I feel like these are resources that that you need to bookmark, right? Like it's yeah. not something that you like <laughs> I found this for my pet and now I never have to go back to this site. I feel like the world is always changing. There are no, new things coming out in the market every single day. So I love that for sure. And I mean, going back, so you've been in the pet food industry for over 15 years. And yeah. I mean, as you were saying, when you first started, pet parent was not <laughs> was not the term it's you would use. not a term. It was like, and your dogs would stay in the backyard and roam around. And, and for all you knew, they were plenty happy to do it. So I'm wondering over the past few years, I mean, what changes have you seen? Do you feel like there's like, I feel like even in in my experience in the last five years, it just feels like amped up so much of like people bringing animals into their home. They are more than like, they are the family member. They're not even just part of the family. They're like the most important part of the family. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, certainly uh, that anthropomorphism where it's like, okay, I'm like I am putting what's happening with in my human space onto what's happening in my pet space. And I think there's certainly, you know, as I'm looking and as this is at first, it was kind of like, oh, that's really great. Like I think about like my grandparents' dogs or even the dog that we had growing up and the the different dogs we had when I was when I was a kid, I would be hard pressed to say that they lived like this super enriched life. Definitely not with my grandparents or some of my older relatives you know, it really was, they were either in the backyard or running, you know, they had a dog house and it didn't matter if, you know, I grew up in Louisiana and so it didn't matter if it was 95 and hundred percent humidity, they were living in the dog house, literally um, in the backyard. And maybe they would go out for a walk or play fetch or something once a day, if they were lucky. I would say there's a lot of positive that has come by moving our pets into the household. And even into the bed, like there, you cannot deny <laughs> the research that goes along with how kids with that grow up with pets, there's a reduced allergies, there's greater confidence, there's greater social interaction, things like that, that, that certainly have been beneficial, older population, and, and even in just the adult, looking at what it does for our blood pressure, um, what it does for, you know, we're very fortunate if we can you can bring your dogs to work. And so pets at work increases, oddly enough, you wouldn't think, but it does actually increase productivity and it increases employee longevity and increases employee interaction and things like that. So there is huge, huge benefits where we have evolved in our relationship with pets. I think our pendulum likes to really, in this country, maybe, I don't know, I've not lived anywhere else. So I can only use the United States as a, as a reference. I've visited a lot of places, but I think we like to, t- we tend to like swing to extremes. And so I, my hope is that, you know, this side where pets are more involved with our family and our true family members, that we don't go too far. An example of that is there's been there's been a huge increase in getting working dogs because people think they're real. I don't know. I think because maybe people think they're really cool because at some point in their lineage, they had a job. Well, what's important is if you're going to get like, for example, a St. Bernard or a Newfoundland, you know, a Bernie's mountain dog that in their lineage, they were working dogs. 
you can't bring them home and expect them to be couch potatoes. You know, they still, because (laughs) we have, Stella is our pointer and she's, has a lot of anxiety. And so she never, even though pointers are designed to be hunting dogs and, you know, point and flush birds, she would never have succeeded in that in that <laughs> role if she'd gotten into a family like that because she is just so very noise phobic. That's one of the blessings now that she's 15. She's deaf, so she's no longer petrified when we have thunderstorms and hailstorms and lightning and, and uh, fireworks and things like that. But mm-hmm. But still, you know, for those breeds that are working and have working dog lineage to give them jobs or find activities that I'm not saying as a, if you have just recently adopted, um, you know, a Bernese mountain dog, you need to move to the mountains and teach the dog to be (laughs) like search and rescue, Mm -hmm. but do things that tap into that. So, you know, having them, you know, in some sort of, either barn hunt or agility or something where they get to use their brains Mm -hmm. can oftentimes just help to kind of, no pun intended, but like scratch that itch that they've got and really give them the quality of life that they were kind of designed and and bred to have. Because, you know, like I said, Stella's never hunted a day in her life. So when we go to the park or we go on a walk, she gets into, she'll see a squirrel and she gets into her mm-hmm. little point formation. And, you know, and it's like, okay, that's not something you should necessarily be pointing. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> it's for her, that's what she thinks. And so really, again, allowing that, that mental energy to, um, to be able to be expressed, I think is super important as our relationships mm-hmm. evolve with our pets. Absolutely. We'll definitely speak to that. Because <laughs> I feel like, I, like I was telling you earlier, it blew my, my pointer. I feel like when I do take him out on runs or we do training or we do some sort of mental stimulation or, or even like physical stimulation throughout the day, I feel like he's just calmer throughout the entire day after that. He doesn't shake. He doesn't whine. He still does his circles and he still gets zoomies a lot. But I, I find that he's a lot less anxious and sort of a lot less, almost like waiting for something to do throughout the day. So it, it, same kind of like with Huskies, when people get, huskies and they keep them in their apartments or their small homes and they don't run them and they're not, you know, actively trying to stimulate them, you get that destructive behavior, you get that anxiety behavior and things like that. So I, for, for me, I definitely find that that's a huge thing is just offering any kind of stimulation throughout the day to keep him, to keep him calm and happy. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. And I know even like in the ways of cats, like one of our coworkers adopted And you'll have to forgive me. I don't even remember the name of the breed, but like the wild, it has like a strain of like wilder cat in this specific breed that she adopted because this breed is like so intelligent and so like huntress kind of a situation that she had to engage so many like smart toys just to satisfy that because otherwise this cat was like so unhappy, like a little bit aggressive because of it, like bouncing off the walls. But as soon as those like smart toys got mixed in, it like solved everything because this cat just needed that. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's one of, you know, I try to always find silver linings. And I think that's one of certainly the silver linings of the quarantine and the situation, the pandemic Mm -hmm. that we're living in right now is it's really started to recognize, you know, there was, there were memes that were, there's hundreds of memes, right? That's okay. (laughs) But one of them talking about, I now understand, you know, after five days in quarantine, why our dogs, to the baseboards and get so excited when Mm -hmm. the mailman comes, you know? And so I think it, it did in a way kind of turn a light bulb on for our pet parents of like, okay, not only am I, do I feel like incredibly more tightly bonded with our pets because they offered entertainment, solace, companionship, you know, through all of this, but then also it kind of was like, okay, well, maybe I, sh- maybe I do need to do more enrichment for them and give them things to expand their knowledge and their world and, and all of that in a, in a different way than just going for a walk every day or playing fetch for five minutes that maybe for the cat parents out there, you know, playing with the feather <laughs> on a string for a little bit. Okay. That at least gets some nervous energy out, but are we are we doing the best we can for, you know, for our four leggeds? And I think that that really helped to show, you know, kind of have that aha moment for us of like, okay, maybe, maybe we aren't, and there is more we can do. And, 
now we actually have the time to be able to build that into our routine and all of that since we're not traveling all over and taking kids to five different sports practices and, you know, have 16 different social engagements to go to, we can really kind of focus in on, on our world and, and be able to help enrich the lives of our pets. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And speaking of focus, so I know you, you as of late, um, you've been focusing a lot on life stage nutrition. Is something that we're all like vaguely aware of, like you get puppy food, you get adult food, and maybe you get senior food. But obviously there is a lot more to it than just that. So I'm wondering if you, maybe you can get into, for the pet parents out there, what they should be looking for at the different stages of their animal's life. Yeah. And and that kind of that feeds right into talking about our quarantine because that's certainly been a benefit. You know, we've seen so many people have adopted dogs and cats or are fostering dogs and cats and or are on the waiting list because there are no dogs to and cats to foster um, and and things like that. So, you know, it, it really it's it's funny. It it hit home very closely because both of my I'm, I'm the youngest total aside, I'm the youngest of four and my older two sisters have had dogs in the past and then they had kids. And as their, their current, the dog that they had passed away, my one sister has four kids and was just like, we cannot like right now have a dog. And my other sister with her two children and run owns her own business and was just like, we are, we cannot have a dog. And now fast forward, however many years it's been, a, it's been a while in the last like two months, both of them have adopted puppies. And I'm like, all right, you're jumping on the bandwagon like everybody (laughs) else. But with that has come this just, you know, never ending litany of questions, which I wholeheartedly love that they are, you know, seeking someone Mm -hmm. who is a credible resource to ask questions, whether it's what kind (laughs) of toenail clippers should I buy or, you know, what pet food should I be purchasing or what treats are safe kind of runs the whole gamut. But you know, it did really just, again, kind of bring, bring to top of mind that there, you know, there's a lot of options out there for our dogs and cats as they go through their life stages. And one of the things to, to kind of keep in mind is there as AFCO, so the American Association of Feed Control Officials, it's a voluntary group that gets together and kind of, and sets the guidelines for what puppies and kittens need as they're growing, what nutrients dogs and cats need as their adults. And so those are really kind of the two big categories. There's no official designation for what a senior dog or cat needs from a nutritional aspect. I think that's for a number of reasons, mostly because so many different, you know, even with our cats and certainly with our dogs, reach senior at different stages, right? Mm -hmm. So a chihuahua is probably not going to be necessarily as senior at seven as say a Great Dane or, you know, going some of those larger breed dogs. And on top of that, then you layer in as our, we're very fortunate that our dogs and cats are living much longer, but as they live longer, then you start to get different medical conditions that can play into how nutrition can be optimized for those dogs and cats. And so there's no real designation there. There's also with AFCO, there's what's called the all life stage. And so that takes into account growth and maintenance. So as a, as a puppy and as an adult dog, and then gestation and lactation. So those we know are the kind of the, that gestation lactation is the highest nutritional demands on the dog. So we want to make sure when we're making a recipe that it covers all of those different kind of high nutrient demand times of life, both at growth and then at the, you know, the other spectrum with gestation and lactation. And so for those puppy and kitten owners, you really, you know, you want to feed them a puppy and kitten formula until they're done growing, which sounds really simple, Mm -hmm. but then it gets a little tricky. So like, like all things in life, because again, a chihuahua is in some of those like smaller smaller to medium breed dogs are going to stop growing anywhere between about nine and seven to 10 months or so. They're going to kind of get to their adult phase. But then you look at somebody like a Great Dane or, you know, a Bernese Mountain Dog 
or Newfoundland and some of these large and giant breed dogs, well, they'll continue to be growing until they're about 18 months old. And then (laughs) you filter (laughs) in there as well if you get them spayed or neutered. So spaying or neutering, we know, drops their metabolism by about 25 to 30% if you look at the research that's out there. So we want to we want to make sure that we keep them on the right formula, but you may have to adjust how much you're feeding after you spay or neuter them to make sure that we're not leading to obesity, overweightedness, which is a you know is such a huge issue in our pet population out there, and and we know that that does decrease not only their length of life but also their quality of life. So. Really, again, that goes back to kind of where where we started of having these really good, productive conversations with pet parents. In the vet space, we're we're pretty fortunate that you know our our dogs or puppies and kittens come in for regular routine vaccines, and so we can one get a good weight on them um, consistently every you know four to six weeks, and two we can have those conversations about how much are you feeding, what are you feeding. Um, let's talk about maybe when we switch to an adult formula and all of that. And then, you know, for our senior pets, because again, they're living, are, they're living longer, um, which is fantastic. And I tried as hard as I could to get my chocolate lab Drake to, to live for forever. But I, I did, I did get 15 years with him and he, but I always would say, you know, whatever I can do to keep, have him live forever, I will, I will do it. But he, as about a seven-year-old, um, which we do know, it's really looking at, medium breed dogs is where most of the research has been done to kind of designate seven as being senior, but it's a pretty good starting point. And you can't, and I feel like in this day and age, you can't start too soon on really having that like more in-depth assessment of what's going on with your dog or your cat at seven. And that's when maybe switching to a senior formula and senior formulas will vary across the board. You know, if you're on one brand of senior pet food, you know, you could pick up a bag from another manufacturer and it's going to be completely different. There are common conditions that affect our senior pets. So things like arthritis are pretty common. Unfortunately, like I said, obesity is a pretty common condition. So looking at calorie content and then things that can help to address some of those common conditions in our senior pets. So things like added omega-3 fatty acids that are really help are good for the joints and good for the skin. And, and that sort of thing could be something that you would look for um, in choosing a food for your senior pet. Oh my gosh, just so much good information there. And I love what you're saying too. I mean, I don't love this, but about like pet obesity, because certainly, especially on our platform, I mean, we do see these animals who like, they go the range, either they're like totally neglected and are very nourished, I guess you could say, where it's like they can barely stand because they've just been kept inside and they haven't gotten the exercise they need. They haven't gotten the proper nutrition they need still, but they are like severely overweight. And I know just as a culture, it sort of feels like some of us just like to show love by giving Mm -hmm. our pets (laughs) extra food or like extra treats. And so it is hard to kind of work our way out of that habit. And I know, especially like maybe special occasions we want to do certain things for our animals. So I'm wondering if there are certain things that you would recommend, like if it's our dog's (laughs) birthday, (laughs) like what is a good thing to give as like a special, because I know it's, it gets into dangerous territory when you go down like the human food route or like something that's overly processed, but granted like very cute and like (laughs) decorated for a birthday situation. Like what would you say is like a good like treat or special occasion food you can give your animal? So Merrick actually makes one called uh, Birthday Potty, P-A-W-T-Y, which I think is really cute. It's a little, you know, it's one little can of food and something like that. Like, and I will also, you know, confess, like our dogs get treats. You know, I am not opposed (laughs) to celebrating and having treats. And really, you know, that is part of our culture is food is love. And certainly with, with our pets as well, they, a lot of times people will think, oh, well, you know, he's, she's coming over. Like, I don't know if you probably hear the little tick tick in the background. That's Stella, my pointer. <laughs> I'm coming over for some pets, but you know, they'll come over and, and our instantaneous thought is, oh, they're hungry. And so I'm going to give them a treat. 
you know, things to keep in mind is that a lot of times treats can be really calorically dense and a 30 calorie treat for a 50 pound dog is, you know, can be similar to us eating a half of a Snicker bar. Okay. Well, you know, you eat a half a Snicker bar here and there, it's probably not going to do you much harm, but you do that three or four times a day for your dog. And then their waistlines, you know, start to grow and grow and grow. It's the same thing for cats as well. And I'll have, my mom has a cat named Luna and she's like, well, she, you know, she stands on my chest at three o'clock in the morning. So I get up and I feed her because I think she's hungry. And, you know, and I'm like, ah, you know, A, you're teaching her, (laughs) like you do that a few times. And now she thinks that three, this is how we get Mm -hmm. food. And, you know, and I'm like, she probably, she's probably not hungry. You know, cats are a bit nocturnal. And so she's, you know, exploring her world. So there are, you know, there are ways that, again, you can bring treats in. And if you've got families that have a bunch of kids, you know, multiple family members, I usually, you know, I'm a big fan putting their treat allotment, almost like a, like a medicine, a a pill uh, container that has the days of the week on it, but putting their treats in there, the allotments for the different days. So, you know, okay. Oh, well, you know what? Finn's already had three treats today. He does not need any more because his, you know, that day is empty. Or you can even use a lot of times really what our pets are seeking are really just attention. Mm -hmm. You know, when they come over, not having the first reaction be, let's give them a treat. How about let's throw the ball or let's get out the little feather on the end of a string and let's play some games. Let's get out the little bouncy balls with glitter inside or, you know, whatever it may be for your dog and your cat. Or, you know, the other alternative too is to actually have a portion of their kibble be used as treat. So whatever they were supposed to get today, you know, if they're getting a cup and a half of food, we'll take a quarter of that cup and put it in the treat jar allotment. And now you're you're still getting that like interaction and it does. It feels good to give our pets mm-hmm. treats, right? And kind of help, help to celebrate. So now you're doing that, but in a very healthy way for them and not adding to that bottom line with their calorie intake that day. I do want to ask, do you think that, so I know with a lot of treats, the, the calorie, like you said, intake is, is rather large. My sister, she, one of her dogs is overweight. And so she didn't want to stop giving her treats. So she actually started incorporating like carrots or celery or broccoli, things that are, I guess, maybe low calorie in human terms. Would that be a good alternative as far, like if you didn't want to maybe overload on treats, you could use that human alternative? Yeah, for sure. You know, certainly the things to avoid are things like grapes and raisins, onions, those sorts of things. But absolutely, you know, you, cutting up little carrots into kind of kibble sized pieces is a great thing to add in there. If they like, some dogs like celery, other dogs are, you know, I've like two of our dogs, Stella and Finn love bananas, our little French bulldog. He tries, he really does. He picks up the little piece of banana and he spits it out and he picks it up again. He wants to eat it because the other Mm -hmm. dogs are, he just doesn't like it. So yeah, so things like that, little chunks of apple, all of that. And and again, in moderation. So yeah, you know, we, again, because we're trying to keep things complete and balanced, a a rough estimate is about 10% their calorie intake can be from treats each day. But that's also okay. So if you start to think about that, most cats eat between 150 and 200 calories a day. So that's really only like 15 calories that are coming from treats. Not a whole lot. You know, there are low, low, lower calorie treats or again, taking a little handful of kibble works really, really well. I love the idea of food, using food instead, because I feel like when I first got blue, I was, I almost like spoiled him with like the very, <laughs> nice treats. And then when I would try and give him maybe a kibble instead, he was like, "Uh uh-uh, like that's not the treat you used to give me. And he used to be very spoiled. So I think (laughs) when we switched over to start giving him kibble, it kind of uh, lowers his, his pickiness. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And you can only imagine if you were giving some treats to Blue and then her, your partner is also giving some treats on, in the other room. It's like, he's just going back and forth. (laughs) They're very, very smart. Like I said, Stella, who is mostly deaf, she can still hear anything that sounds like a treat bag opening. So they are <laughs> they are pretty like dialed in somewhere in all of their genes and wiring. They can they have that spidey sense when it comes to treats. 
Oh, yeah. Manipulators at heart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they definitely know how to play me. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, so I know you've already said that you have that you have a few of brought your personal pets at home. So we do have some kind of fun questions. So I know you have three of them, so you can <laughs> choose, pick and choose um, whether they apply to one or all of your dogs. So if your pet was president, what would be the first thing they did? Well, I'll start with Rig- Wrigley's, my French bulldog. And he would require the indoor temperature of all facilities everywhere to be set at 95. <laughs> I really feel bad for the little guy. I'm living in Colorado, but he, like, he, I take him to take him in the car with us when I go drop off my son at, at kindergarten. And like this morning, I have the heat on the floor and he's laying on the floorboard, like glued up against where the heat comes off. And even in the summertime, it'll be 95 outside and he will lay out there in the sun like he is part reptile. And then Finn, my Labrador, I'll just use the two boys in this case, but the, Finn as, as the Labrador would make sure that all human socks are actually 100% completely digestible. Oh my gosh. Because he has an obsession. It doesn't matter if they're clean or dirty, but he loves to eat socks. And I should knock on wood that um, thus far, every sock has made it out one way (laughs) or the other without requiring surgery. But he, it's definitely been a learning for us that we cannot leave socks out and even the clean laundry has to be hidden from him because he will eat them. Oh my gosh. That would be like a, a great treat or toy idea. Like just like a set of socks that are like <laughs> digestible and like good for you. Oh my gosh. So what is the naughtiest thing <laughs> your pet has done? Well, Stella is perfect because she's the girl of the family. So she's never done anything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Finn, beyond his his sock obsession, the other thing that he had once did was he actually ate an entire long sleeve pajama top of my son's when he was three years old. You know, not like a newborn onesie. Like this was a long sleeve size 3T pajama top down in block, a whole thing down the hatch because Alexander had spilled his cereal on his pajamas and my husband took off his pajamas to go and then got, went to go get some clothes and and a washcloth to kind of clean them off. And he came back in the room and the pajama top was gone. And that actually sat in Finn's stomach for seven days. And you would have no idea. Like he was eating and drinking and playing and going on runs with me. And no idea and that there was actually this like wadded up pajama top in his stomach. And eventually we did, I, I took him into the clinic and we, we made him vomit because I was like, I've got a business trip to go on. And I, if we need to have surgery, I want to be able to do it. And so we brought him into the clinic and made him throw up. And sure enough, the whole pajama top, long sleeve, everything <laughs> came out. And Alexander was there and he asked if we were going to take it home and wash it. And I was like, no, no, we are not. No, we are not. <laughs> oh my God, stomach of steel. I know, I know. It's crazy. That's like almost impressive if it wouldn't be so horrifying. For seven days too. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. And really, I think had had we washed it with a little bit of bleach, you may not have really, really known. But we did not. We did not. Not happening. Oh my gosh. Yeah, you must be having to replenish your wardrobe pretty consistently with uh-huh. with him around. <laughs> exactly. Uh oh. At least with socks. Oh my gosh. So, if you had to pick one life motto, what would it be? I would say stronger every day. So, really, whether that is, and that actually came. My sister gave me a little charm that hangs on my computer bag that says that, and and it really is whether that is just emotionally stronger, stronger in my field of veterinary medicine, stronger in my communication skills and my stronger in my love of all of, you know, the fortunate, the, you know, my, the people that I'm fortunate enough to be surrounded by all. I think that's pretty much all encompassing. Absolutely. And I mean, even going back to what we were talking about, about how 
we've all been growing over the years and we're ex- accepting our dogs in- into different areas of our home and and helping to improve their nutrition. I feel like it's a learning experience for yeah. all of us. And I think that's something to keep in mind of like, don't hold guilt for what you've been doing in the past, just keep improving. That's such a great motto for sure. Well, thank you so much for joining us with your beautiful Colorado background. It was so wonderful talking to you. And I know this is going to be so helpful. I mean, it's already been helpful for me. So it's going to be so helpful for so many people. Yeah, happy to do it. And it's great to see y'all after all of the communications. It was so wonderful having Dr. Ruth Ann on. We loved how she got into so much in regards to our pet's nutrition and how every pet is an individual. Currently, we at Cuddly have been partnering with Merrick to try and give our rescue pets on our platform a little extra nutritional support. And we love that everything that's been going into it is so scientific and it's benefiting them in such wonderful ways. If you wanna learn more about Merrick or Dr. Ruth Ann, you can check our show notes or our blog. And we really love from hearing from you guys. So go ahead and try and rate this podcast and leave us a review. We just love what you have to say. We want to hear from you. And also be sure to follow Cuddly on all social media accounts at We Love Cuddly. That's going to be C-U-D-D-L-Y. Thanks, guys.